Enjoy. Hello again, and uh, yes, this is Ivan Tradal, uh, the English version of uh, the earlier moderator. Uh, I have a black shirt, no red sweater, different language. Uh, we're going to discuss journalism uh, in relation to aid in this video. And we have uh, journalists with us. We have Ivar Iversen from uh, Dagsavisen. Are you here? Oh, there you are. Welcome. Take a seat. We also have Marn Sebe from uh, Verdens Mag Magazine X, the World Magazine X. And we have our old friend Nils Mark again from Legerut Nirense, Doctors Without Borders. Now I guess we could almost pick up where the old, the last discussion kind of ended, or maybe began. Uh, we uh, have a video here that is closely, uh, you know, it, 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 it's pointed mainly maybe at the media and the way the media portrays aid and Africa in, you know, specifically. And, uh, you know, Doc Savisen and Vardens Magazine X are maybe like the best in class here, for all I know, you know to media outlets that maybe have a, have a stronger focus on aid than many other newspapers. But are you still to blame for this? Do you, do you recognize this criticism, uh, Eva? Um, sure. I'm uh, then Ivor Iverson from uh, <laughs> Dagsavisen. Yes, Ivor. <laughs> Ivor. Not as bad, though, as my old friend, Odd Seaman. Oh, yes. Yeah, he never went abroad. <laughs> never got a child. Um, sure. Um, I, I was, um, what was I, 15 at the time of, uh, no, I was not, seven, seven years old at the time of uh, Band-Aid. <laughs> um, and so I also grew up with this image of Africa. Um, and it's been, uh, it's been a, a constant in, in the media coverage for the 12 years I've worked in Daxavis now with Africa. But, but still, things are changing, not only in our newspaper. I brought um, one example here from Time Magazine. This is Time Magazine cover of this week, or last week is it, Africa Rising. It's the world's next economic powerhouse, but huge challenges lie ahead. Um, and we've had those stories as well. I think at least three of them for the past year. Um, this kind of counter narrative that uh, we used to believe that thing was so, so bad, but look here, there's something else. Um, and we had one story in, in June, um, which was generated from an opinion poll by um, Fellas Rode for Africa, saying that the uh, Africa pessimism was starting to recede, and now we have a new Africa optimism. Uh, and we could go into more, more details about uh, what um, what this implies later. But I think there is a, there is a t the topic that this m uh, movie raises has been noted also in the media, and is to a certain degree reflected in media coverage over the past couple of years at least. Yeah. Marn, do you want to uh, elaborate, maybe, or? Uh Give your comment. Uh, I guess I'm one of the critics. Um, mm. uh, I can say as well, in, in, um, when Band-Aid uh, had their sort of tour de force, uh, I was seven as well, but I was in Angola, so it was a sort of a different sort of angle of it. Um, there was... Uh, the Angola angle. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, sorry, so it's a very sort of bad pun. I'm very <laughs> sorry. Uh, continue. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 I might have grown up with a different picture of Africa than, than um, some other people in the pa panel, and I've also been one of those people criticizing, also Dax Avisen, and he's my editor as well, so I have to be a bit careful here. <laughs> but um, I remember the last time Dax Avisen had sort of the, the very decimated child on, on their front page, it was 2009, I think. It was about eight policies. Um, and I wrote some very angry comment uh, that was published in Aftenposten. Uh, <laughs> that was before I started writing comments from Daxavis. Um, and at that time, I didn't get a reply. Uh, but I did get a reply from uh, Martin Höglund, uh, who was here earlier, because he, he agreed with me. Um, He's a very agreeable man. We've come to He's learn. very agreeable. Um, you're not treating him fairly, though. But 
uh, at that time, uh, that was quite common in Norwegian press, but that has changed for the past three sort of years. That was in 2009. There's a completely different picture now. Um, one of my problems today is that it might change into um, a very... They're going sort of the other length to the over positive side. It's a very good nightlife in Kampala. I re very recently researched it. Uh, Ange Noir, very good club. Um, <laughs> but press freedom is going down the drains. It's some terrible things happening uh, around the parliament and with the opposition parties in Kampala and in Uganda. Um, so it, it's, it's all nice with this new positive sort of um, view of Africa, but um, we still need to see the politics behind it. We still need to see the um, how uh, the economy is not just going up, up and up, but also going, uh, being more and more like a crony capitalism, being more and more um, a powerful tool for the already powerful. So, so it's 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 good that his it has changed from the decimated child, but uh, one should be careful not going to the other length as well. Uh, Nils, I'm not sure. I, by the way, Morten, are you still here? If I was unfair, I'm very sorry. I was not. Uh, I didn't mean to. Uh, sincerely, uh, I'll send him a mail later. But uh, Nils. Right, just to follow up on what um, Marna said quite wisely, I, I, I agree with, with both the points of view. This is, this is ominous for your debate, yes. I'm afraid. <laughs> but we'll see what we can do. Um, yes, we have, a, we have quite a, a, a simplified version in our mentality about, about Africa, which is a bunch of countries. We keep talking about, even in this debate, we keep talking about Africa. Have you noticed? Oh, yeah. Mm. Um, <laughs> So good with the clapping. She's, she's awesome. Yes. But ultimately, I mean, we have a very simplified version of America, if you're going to talk about that, or Latin America, or even, even the, the one big country, the USA, we have a very simplified version, or Germany, for that matter. You've got loads of cliches and simplified versions. Of I actually only things. have a complex version of maybe two or three countries. Which ones? Uh, Norway, Denmark, Sweden. Yes. I thought so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure your Danish thing is quite simplified. I was there this weekend, okay. so I actually, uh, yeah, I got to talk to a few. I've talked to a lot of Danes. Just ask me. That's good. <laughs> so what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that it's ultimately it's got to be a question of space as much as anything. Because if I was editor of a newspaper, which I'm not, sadly, but if I was and I had one page to do on Africa, what's it going to be? It's, it isn't going to be the nightlife of Kampala we keep coming back to. It isn't. It's going to be probably the refugee crisis in Sudan or the, the, the developments in, in, uh, in the Congo. That's what it's going to be about. Because those are the biggest news from Africa today. I'm sorry, I, you know, that's not, it's not convenient from a liberal point of view. We want to have a, a, a more a more open view of Africa. But if you've got one page, two pages, say, say you're a big tabloid in Norway. I mean, this is, this is X and Oxavis, two of the most, you know, voluminous, the, the biggest areas to have Africa. If you're Vega, how much space have you got for Africa? Well, half a page? And what's it going to be? Is it going to be fashion? No. No, it's not, because there are, you know, there are 160,000 people in just one of the new refugee camps in, in, in South Sudan. What, are you going to ignore it? No. So the question is, it's very interesting, you know, you've got the journalism debate, and that's the right debate to have, because it ultimately the question is, how much space are we going to have for proper foreign news in Norway in, in to, tomorrow and in one year and in ten years? And how are we going to fill it, and how are we ever going to portray anything in a... In a, um, in a broader perspective. Uh, Martin, I guess, was the first one, and then you, Evie? Well, that's um, part of the problem is that there's very, very, very little coverage of Africa. Um, I'll just use the, the continent and not specific countries. There's even less coverage of French speaking Africa or Portuguese speaking Africa. But, um, and when you have one page or two pages, it's normally the humanitarian issues and the humanitarian crisis. Uh, it's never the politics or the economy, and it's never the nightlife in Kampala, even though it's splendid. Um, so you, I think most of the, the uh, sort of the stereotypes that, that you get that sort of SIE is trying to counter is exactly that. The only pages in 
Dagblad, VG, Aftenposten, uh, in NRK, <laughs> the only sort of senderflate. Mm. Don't know that in English. But uh, would cover humanitarian crisis, not even aid, because as, as we know, there's a difference between humanitarian aid and then development aid. So, so, so it would be... Um, it would be sort of the the, the worst case scenarios. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, worst case scenario all the all the time, and, and you would get sort of uh, just the decimated child. Just you the, look the, great. That's what it said on the. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <coughs> but 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 that, that's my problem with with most of uh, and, and the problem with the pressure as well from the humanitarian organisation is is for us to write on that uh, while. I'm very interested in politics. I majored in, in African politic, politics. That's my sort of issue. That's my that's what I do, um, and I want to see what's behind the stories and and what's. I, I, I'm very lucky. Uh, I just made like 20 pages today on, on oil politics in Sudan, and just sent it to the print. I'm very very happy for that. Um, I, I'm sort of sort of a, the the one percent that can do that among journalists 20 page article in a newspaper no oh in a journal <laughs> but it's not very tabloid is it it's not uh, not very tabloid yeah. but 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 then um it's not going to hit uh the big press and um, unless there's a humanitarian catastrophe in the same area it's an area known for humanitarian catastrophes it's, it's the borderlands between sudan and south sudan um so my problem is that the humanitarian uh, sort of view of these areas are too dominant. Ivar? Um, Ivar. I'm sorry, Ivar. I'll, um, I'll try to be the, the one to, uh, to nuance the, uh, the word Africa here. Um, if, you have to, if you are debating media coverage of Africa, we have to ask what is Africa and what is the media. And to take the... Um, what is IS also in the middle? And what is is that we will leave that for the philosophy hour later, um, but to start with Africa, um, there is at least uh, you can see a difference now the past couple of years between sub-Saharan Africa and northern Africa, at least Egypt and, and, and Libya and Tunisia after the so-called Arab Spring. Um, <clears throat> we have a we have two correspondents in Daxavis, and one is in the Middle East. He's been there for twenty years, and he said when people started to um, to rise up in in these countries, it was also a liberation for him to write about it, because suddenly he wasn't just asked about stories about um, the Israel-Palestinian conflict, but he was asked about writing, writing about these countries also, and not just writing about the old dictators uh, and great power politics, but about people who turned out to um, look just like us and to talk just like us and use Twitter and Facebook and, and, and so on. Um, and maybe we were a bit too um, thrilled by this, that we didn't write enough about the Islamists at, at the time. But still, uh, there was a, I think it was a turning point in, in the entire Western media, what happened um, a couple of years ago. And then, about what is the media, I go back to, to Neil's point, that um, uh, if you look at the different medias in, in Norway, you'll get quite a different picture. Uh, and it's quite revealing um, onto where the market is. And our paper writes quite sure not enough about Africa or Latin America or East Asia or, or whatever, but if you look at the main dominant sources of news, uh, Veganet, the by far biggest news source in Norway, 1.7 million users each day, you'll find hardly anything. And the reason is quite simple. They can actually measure every minute, every hour, every day what people uh, read and what they like. And you'll be quite sure that uh, a story about the now very famous nightlife in Kampala wouldn't uh, reach anywhere near the top. Um, and that's my, my biggest concern about the, uh, the future of, of foreign news in general, that um, when the uh, papers, as in papers, are dead in a, some years from now, as I'm sure they will be, um, there will be less um, incentives to, to make the expensive and uh, more complicated news about uh, the more important stuff. So that goes back to, to you here. I'm not sure, I'm sure you're a more... Um, selected crowd that will actually read the foreign news and they like the in-depth analysis, but um, as long as there are only 200 of them, there will be a small market. Nils, you uh, wanted well, to comment? Yes, in in, uh, in the interest of having a good debate, I, I, I would just like to say that I couldn't disagree with you more, Martin. I mean, you know, you, you're saying that, you know, 
that it's too dominant, that Unitarian news is too dominant. Um, and I, I, I honestly, my, my, in our daily life in, in MSF, we, you know, we, it is painful to see how much of the heavy death tolls that you see in the world that never even reach end to bit, doesn't even get a notice. And then we're talking about we're talking about tens and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that die without ever having even made it to anyone's consciousness. That is quite a hard thing to have to accept in a globalized, big global village. That it doesn't even it. We're not we're not talking headline news. We're not even talking notices. It doesn't happen. It doesn't because it's essentially it's not important enough to people. So I, I disagree with that. But I do think you've also got a point, partly. Because the, the humanitarian cost of anything is often got a political background. It often stems from something. You just finished a 20-page thing on the oil conflict in Sudan, and I've just spoke about humanitarian disaster based on the big, um, big movements of refugees from North Sudan to South Sudan. And these two things are, are very closely linked. And of course, the difference is that MSF, being a non-political organization, we can't talk about the politics. We only, s we only say what we see. We bear witness to what we're seeing in the field. We're not going to go into and an analyze the, the political situation. But oh, so many times have I sent out a press release or talked to a journalist and kind of have hoped that someone is going to take up the baton, take up the thing, and do some other searches and, and spend some time on it. But in the modern media world, you've got to publish. I mean, 20 pages, Marian, you're the only journalist in Norway who, who, who writes 20 pages about anything. Everyone else writes four stories a day, and you've got to get it published. So you publish before you even fact check, and you don't check more than three sources if you even have three. And half the time, you just cut and paste. Oh, but it's true. That's the problem. Secrets of the communication trade there. Uh, we never cut and paste. No, I mean, no, no. You make things that they copy and paste, of course. Uh, Marin. You want to uh, reply to the heavy criticism? Yeah, I think um, it, it's not that the humanitarian news are, are sort of dominant, but it's dominant amongst the news that it's about, for instance, Africa, uh, and also other parts of the world, some every now and then. But um, I think one of the reasons why you don't see journalists doing this uh, uh, and don't see audiences wanting it is because it's crap as well. Because a lot of the humanitarian stories are, they do have sort of a, a blah, blah, it goes like that. Um, there's th something is very bad. We have an interview with a white, uh, preferably a Norwegian aid worker. Uh, we have some more figures, and we do have some victims that uh, just have uh, one name, if they have names at all in the story. And it, it's crap journalism. It's, it's, it's really bad journalism. And it, it, it plays on stereotypes, and it is bad research from the journalist. It's bad, um, I, I, I don't know who sort of uh, got the, most of the time it's, it's the humanitarian organizations that takes the journalists into these camps or villages or whatever. And it's, it, they're not doing it. Um, sort of properly. Uh, there's no quality in the work. It, it makes bad reading. Uh, it me, uh, it's, just, it's just crap. And you won't get audiences interested in that kind of, of humanitarian sort of crisis or humanitarian stories with that kind of crap journalism. So it goes to both of you. <laughs> um, so what is that? The, the, the journalism done on humanitarian issues. In general. In general. Uh, not mine, but <laughs> a lot of the journalism, it, like I said, it is very stereotypical uh, and hardly ever deals with the political realities behind the story. Uh, it's very driven by the humanitarian organization that actually takes the journalist. We are, we are sort of, we need the humanitarian organizations when we go into emergency areas. We need the MSF. We need Norwegian People's Aid. We need Norwegian Church Aid. Otherwise, we wouldn't go there. We need the logistics. But we do also need to be critical, and we do need to sort of use our normal journalistic uh, tools when we go into that kind of situations. Otherwise, we'll just keep on writing crap stories, and the audience wouldn't be interested. 
I would like to maybe, uh, because we're going to have some comments from the audience in maybe about five, six minutes, uh, hopefully some of you might have some comments or uh, preferably questions. Uh, journalism, you know, what I know about, for example, uh, the, the, the Norwegian uh, hospitals is that there are queues and people are dying unnecessarily and some small village doesn't have like their further availing, whatever. Uh, and also, uh, you know, in, in the summer, uh, Norwegian summer is all about getting killed by ticks, uh, life-threatening things, and like, uh, it's, it's, that's yeah, kind of... Tick bite fever in Africa. Oh, well. yeah, I know. But uh, what I'm saying is, that's journalism, right? It's, it's about things that are urgent and simple in, in one way or another. That's kind of good news. That's something people react to and want to read. So isn't, isn't it kind of counter, co contrary to all journalism to ask for something that's complicated and not urgent? Like, it's, uh, Africa's going well, but it's complicated and it's going to take a long while. That's a boring article, isn't it? Do you want <laughs> You're not the most tabloid journalist, I know, but uh, Eva, do you, do you have a comment? It is a challenge. And journalism is, by definition, about negative things and about fast... Uh, intuitive things. Um, you have to show, you have to paint the picture with a very broad brush. And I think maybe if you look at it the other way around, the, the band, um, not band-aid, but the radiate uh, was uh, great in showing the stereotypes. I have a band-aid here, actually. It's, uh, uh, I have a cat on my finger. Uh, looking yes. the other way around, you could also see from some of the media coverage about Norway after the 22nd of July, uh, reading how very um, uh, serious big newspapers portrayed Norway. You could, it, felt kind of simplistic, and uh, they didn't get the depth of it. Mm. That's always, uh, you will never be able to make the same kind of coverage from on something very far away. Um, um, and a second point is that uh, in order to, you also need to make some kind of identification. You need the, it's, I see it's, for me it's hard to get around the pictures of, of starving kids if you write about starving kids. Of, of course your article should include some kind of analysis of the political things um, lying behind. Um, but it's, it's just a fact of life that you have to be, uh, you have to, be to a certain degree simplistic and uh, use emotions to, to get somewhere. Mm. Nils? Yeah, I, just in defense of, uh, of foreign journalists, because I think you're right. I mean, the foreign journalists Sorry, the journalists in Norway are writing about foreign issues, right? The ones that are doing it, God bless them, they're doing a good job with what they got, honestly. And it, what I mean by what they got is there's too few of them, and they have to publish every four hours, and they have to publish on, on, on the website as well as on print, and they've got to take pictures. And I've seen, I once saw a journalist doing, sorry, and video journalists as well. I once saw a journalist doing all three at the same time, and it was, it was terrifying, and I just wanted to give her a hug. It was, it was horrible. Mm. And, and when you do that, how are you going to do the political analysis and casing it and doing everything? And the reason they're doing this is because you've got to publish more and more and more, and you've got to do it yourself because that's more cheap. And then, you know, you can make more money for your shareholders. Sound very pessimistic. I have to, uh, <laughs> have to say. No, it, please it's, it's, give me uh, give me positive news here. But it's, that's it's my perfectly image. possible to make a good analysis of a very uh, strange country in five thousand um, letters. If you want to, um, Martin does it every four weeks for 5, us. Five thousand letters is quite long, though. Five thousand. What is you call it? Um, Bookstavid. Yeah, it's it's um, still you know one single page. That was my point. Yeah. Uh, Martin does it every four weeks for us, writing about Somalia or Sudan in a very um, accessible way. Um, so it's. It's possible it's easier in print than in, in TV. It's, it's, uh, if you have a one-hour documentary, you can make a good, good background, mm -hmm. background analysis, and a three-minute uh, Doc Stevens segment, it's much, much harder. And that's also the, the nature of news. So, um, uh, again, it's a <laughs> defense of the slow and expensive news, but it, it costs money to make, and you have to, you have to pay if you're, uh, if you're interested. If only the politicians had stayed, they could uh, increase the support for the... <laughs> well, they're actually quite nice. In, in Norway, yes. we, uh, we, we get lots of money. We travel on, on these scholarships with both uh, mm. De and and from, from the ministry, traveling to, uh, to faraway places that we wouldn't have gone if they had not done it. And it's controversial within the media. We're one of the few medias who do it, and we feel kind of dirty doing it because we're in the hands of these, the government or the organization, but it's still a way to, to get out and to actually be on the ground and to make these stories. Yes, I think we'll uh, need to uh, open up the floor for questions from the audience again. Uh, again, I would. Uh, you ready? Uh, because uh, 
I would insist on uh, formulating it as a question and trying to make it, uh, you know, p directed to one of the members of the panel. Yes. Hello, my name is uh, Jörn, uh, and I have some uh, questions. Um, let's formulate one to Nils Mark, for example. You just said uh, a couple of minutes ago that uh, you thought, or uh, you thought that all the uh, Norwegian journalists writing on foreign issues did a very good job. And I was hoping that um, you and the panel, that you would kick towards some of the other uh, news agencies a little bit more in this debate. Um, say, for example, one uh, uh, issue that sparked some controversy this fall, for example, was uh, Sunano, Mr. Sunano, and our case uh, correspondent in Africa, when he wrote about Enkepuler uh, i Luulan, for example. Uh, translated, widow fuckers in uh, Luulan. Uh, it was an interesting story to it's read. Almost but it ex as exciting as the nightlife in uh, Kampala. Almost as uh, yes. exciting. But uh, the thing is, we have so we have one uh, news agency in Norway, at least, which has uh, uh, some certain privileges uh, in educating uh, the Norwegian population. Um, and it's kind of strange, like, when I, when I read the article, I, I was amused by it, but it's kind of strange that they use the space they've got on, on those topics. It's kind of like if, if a Saudi news reporter came to Norway and wrote about SM sex, for example. It would look very strange uh, for a Saudi newsreader, uh, newsreaders, I'm sure, uh, if that's kind of the picture they got. Um, then, again, um, two uh, months later, Tom Christiansen, a, news, uh, a journalist I, I like very much, uh, he then uh, wanted to portray something positive uh, from uh, Ethiopia, and uh, then he uh, interviewed two uh, editors from uh, two big newspapers in, in Ethiopia, and they told him that the press was not as harassed as most people thought. And I'm just wondering, do you think that is good journalism, just to, to uh, pick certain stories and simplify them quite much, um, despite having um, actually traveled to those places? And it's very hard for other people to double check or to nuance the picture very much. When you actually have that privilege, do you think that NRK, NRK is, is uh, what should say, filling their mandate in a proper way? It's a yes or no question, so just quick answer. <laughs> Anyone? No. First one. Okay, that's a no? No, okay, so you can get to elaborate, but only one person gets to elaborate. I don't think it's that. Eva? I, think, yes. I don't think it's too bad, actually. I, I've, seen the, I've seen the debate, it was in our paper, I believe. There was a few op-eds about, um, about him, um, and I haven't followed his coverage in that much detail, but again, looking at the other way around, um, even though the Saudi papers wouldn't report about SM6 in Norway, it's, it is the curious, strange, weird things that get pick, gets picked up from far away. Uh, and it's it's also a fact of life, but still, I think he, he does quite quite a bit of different stuff as well in, in between. That was at least his answer in our, in our paper, in between those strange stories. Um, and I'm sure there he could be more, as everyone, uh, more at times doing a better job of finding the right sources and balancing the stories, but um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm in favor of him. <laughs> and he's, the, the biggest problem is, is that he's the only one. There's just one correspondent in the entire continent from Norway. Nils? Uh, just very quickly, um, I, when I first read the criticism of Sunano, I agreed, and then when I read his reply in, in your excellent paper, I kind of went, okay, fair enough. Could, and ultimately, it's not a question of him. It's a question of the editor. Because the editor chooses where the stories go, right? It's, no, it's not soon enough. He can't decide this is, and call in and say, this is Doxterium for sure. Uh, it's the editors who decide where the stories go. And if they think that uh, widow sex in Lureland is going to get more clicks and more viewers than, than some other quite, uh, quite tedious and long-winded political analysis, uh, then that's what they're going to choose. Because it's all about clicks and it's all about viewership. And that kind of plays the ball over away from the journalists and away from the editors and into people, right? Because who clicks on stuff? It's you guys and your aunties and uncles and, and everyone else around Norway. And as long as people click much more on widow sex in Lurland, you're going to get widow sex in Lurland. I, I, d I don't propose a solution. I'm just proposing a bigger problem. I don't know, a solution, I don't know. Uh, we also get sex stories from Norway, to be fair, so it's balanced. But Marn, you... Uh there is a difference between uh, what Dag Blind and Vega needs to do to get clicks and NRK. 
uh, because uh, Enerco has the position where they actually can educate, where they actually can use their position uh, and their resources uh, to, to do proper stories. I, I, I think that the correspondent that the Enerco has chosen to send to Africa, I, I think it's a catastrophe, basically. Uh, and, and that story just sort of filled the cup. But it, because it is the Enerco, because they have the, the, the power they have, they have the only correspondent from Norway in Africa, and he chose to do quite a lot of those stories. And he, I think the NRK, because they don't uh, need to think about click, they don't need to think about click like Vega and Dagbra does. They can do all the other things. They can educate the, the, the public. They can educate uh, people in general. They can do the unpopular stories, but they choose not to. So it's, it's not just the correspondence fault. It's, it's something, something wrong with that whole system, how they think for a news uh, when, when that's what they do. We have another question from a former panelist, Anja. And we, um, this might be the last one, depending on how quick you are to answer. Thank you. This question is... And make it a question. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, it's about ethics, and it's just as much to Nils Mörk as it is to the journalists we have here. Um, when we were making the video, we... We, were, we wanted to get images of freezing Norwegian children in it because that's something that would uh, cause perhaps a bit of sympathy from other people in other countries. And, and we thought it was kind of a funny way of showing what uh, you normally see in fundraising videos. Anyways, uh, we couldn't get uh, permission to show these images of uh, freezing children um, even even children, happy children playing in the snow in the kindergarten wasn't uh, possible. NRK wouldn't let us. Um, uh, even though they have got permission to use those that footage in their programs. So anyway, we were thinking, this is very strange. We can't get any uh, footage of Norwegian children. While as in all these fundraising campaigns uh, from uh, development organizations and in media... Uh, you always see these images of, of uh, poor children who are often alone, seem to be taking care of themselves. There's no one around to take care of them. Um, and, and I'm just thinking, how, how is that okay? Like, is it okay to go into other countries and take those pictures and just print it as much as you want, as long as it's in Norway? And why is it, why is it like that? Um, and, and especially, Nils, if, if you have some comments on that, I think that would be very interesting. Is it okay and why? Nils, you're the first one. Uh, right, okay. Um, or why not? If, if your answer is no, yeah, go ahead. My answer is going to be nye. <laughs> it, it's not going to be a yes or no. I'm why of course nye? I'm sorry. It's because um, it's incredibly difficult, isn't it? That's, that's the most difficult thing there is almost in, in doing what, what part of my job is is to go down there and you have people in an incredibly difficult and sensitive situation, right? Um, say, for instance, I just came back from Central African Republic. You have people who've come in with their kids. And we had, we had, we had uh, a mom and dad come in with a, with a, with a four-year-old who died from tetanus, from Steve Trumper, right? Scratch your knee, die from Steve Trumper, right? And we, we, we filmed it and we took pictures. And we had to ask, I mean, what are you going to do? Are you going to give them a form? They, these people could not read or write. Where do you start? We had to have two translators to, to explain to them we would like to take pictures, and we had to show them on the back of the camera what it looks like to take pictures. This is Central African Republic. This is not Nairobi. This is not nightlife in Kampala. Africa is a big place, and Central African Republic is probably one of the most backward places in, on the continent. It's incredibly difficult, but do they understand it? Yes, and, and when you get to the bottom of it, what you've what you got to tell them is we, we want to tell people what's happened to your daughter and why. And do people agree? Yeah, mostly they do. Do I have everything in contract and written form? I mean, no, half the time you don't because it's, it's, not, it's not realistic. It would be good in order to satisfy stuff that you feel like you need in Norway. But you've got to kind of swim in the water you're in and, and, and respect people where they are and try and, and you know, communicate with them. 
Is it difficult? Yes. And do people breach this? Do people just run around and take pictures all the time? Yeah, of course they do. But they're not going to do it with MSF, not as long as I'm around anyway. It's just not done because it's the worst abuse I can think of, of people in an already vulnerable position. Ivar, uh, we have another question, but I don't think we have time for it. So I'm, I'm sorry, but you have to ask it maybe later in private. Yes. Yeah, just a short, uh, there's a, um, I, I agree with this. Um, this is a dilemma, and the, the standard should be the same. You should ask and get permission in the same way wherever you are. But there's also a, a different part of this, and that's the what we accept of showing uh, in terms of misery and, and dead people. And again, the 22nd of July was a reminder about this when a Swedish photographer got the international award for showing uh, for pictures showing dead people at Utøya, uh, pictures that no Norwegian newspaper would print. But the same kind of pictures we would print um, all the time when it's from some somewhere far away. Uh, so we do have a, a different level of, uh, of what we accept and I'm um, depending on, on where where the picture is taken for sure. I think we, uh, I go back to my earlier statement that uh, there is a general will to get the communication directors, people working in communication to Africa to help them. Uh, to, to get a better image. I'm not sure, protect their rights, if I understand you correctly, Anja. But uh, we uh, have to uh, round off this discussion. Uh, very interesting. Uh, Ivar Iversen, uh, foreign uh, editor in Doxavisen. Marn Seiber, editor of Verdens Magazine X, O'Neill Smirk, from Le Doctors Without Borders. Thank you very much. And, and thank you. If you if you venture over there to the the small bar there will be a small thing waiting